May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of do as little harm as possible. Today we have a guest, Jeff Broadbent. He's a professor of sociology and the sociology of religion in Minneapolis. He was a, a, an early student at Tassar. He's gone to school in Japan and, and studied Zen in Japan and taught in Japan. Anyway, you'll hear all about it. And uh, we'll get right into talking with Jeff just as soon as we've had our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, hit pause. And meditate or whatever for as long as you like and when you're ready to come back, hit unpause, and we'll be here waiting to hit the bell to end the meditation. And we'll get into talking with Jeff Broadbent. Hello. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Hey. Hey, David. Good to hear from you. Yeah. Good to talk to you. So, hey. What's happening? What are you What are you up to? Oh, well, I'm just the same old thing. I'm still a professor at the University of Minnesota, mm-hmm. teaching um, sociology uh, courses, like a course on environment and society, uh, where I teach. I I start them out with three minutes of mindfulness meditation. And then we talk about uh, mindfulness and and uh, per- respect or, or wonder or awe at, at nature. And mm. we're, what we're just doing now. And later we go into other aspects of it. And then I'm teaching a course in social theory where I just went went them had them read. Uh, some some readings from Karl Marx, and we're talking about alienation of labor. You know, like feeling like you're really in a shit job, and and uh, you're just being treated like a robot. Mm. That kind of thing. I remember you were a, a long time ago. God, at least ten years ago, maybe twenty. Uh, you were teaching. Uh, sociology and environment and and you you focused on um, uh, mm, uh, how to deal with disinformation uh, climate denial uh, that sort of thing I remember talking to you about about that uh, yeah so what was that about 
And are, oh, you, well. are you still doing that? And, and why don't you explain it? Yeah, okay, well, yeah, I, you know, um, I've been working on environmental problems for a long time. And it, you know, it started with my time at Tassajara hmm. when I became aware of, of nature. And, um, but uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so, I've been working on, on climate change and uh, how uh, different countries are reacting to trying to cut down their carbon emissions that are causing climate change. And I started a, back in uh, 2007, I started in a group of people around the world who are doing research on this in their own countries. And then we uh, compare results and try to understand, you know, what can help societies move towards green energy, towards uh, wind and solar and get rid of uh, fossil fuels. <clears throat> what are the uh, main barriers and the main supports for making that transition? So that's been the focus of my uh, international project and uh you know, we've been learning some lessons, and I've been really pleased to learn about the the German example where they've done really good work on that and mm. developed a lot more wind power and solar power than we have in the United States. Because that's the way to, you know, we're facing such a danger with climate change globally. Yeah. You know, that that's one of the big issues in the world today, and I wanted to try to help in some little way uh, towards that solution. Yeah. To me, it's the big issue. Uh, uh, and I, uh, I do a lot of podcasts here with uh, local people. I have one, one day a week live in Bali, and I always ask them about climate change and what they think about it. And I find it very common, but not just people there, people anywhere to say, well, they, they try to recycle or, you know, they, they, like a person said recently, they try not to take an extra trip to the store. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's both those things are, are good, but they're sort of missing the point to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, people will associate pollution with it, uh, and and that's true. But um, you know, reducing the the amount of carbon dioxide the, that that's going into the atmosphere and it's in the atmosphere, just to me, it it uh, it's way more important than anything else because other problems have a longer timeline. It seems to me. What do you think about that? What do you mean longer uh, timeline for, for solutions, you mean? Yeah, I mean, like, say, uh, uh, there's a, a worldwide recycling problem. America, it just, it just it, you know, it's recycling. is just, uh, it can't keep up with it, doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, and, uh, but we have, we can deal with recycling over a longer period of time without uh, civilization being destroyed. But uh, that's true, yeah. But with climate change, it seems to me that it's urgent and item number one uh, that that I don't think we're dealing with. I don't think we show an inclination. I mean, all the people trying to do things are sort of outgunned by uh, wanting to keep the money flow going the same way. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, uh, the small little actions of individuals don't, you know, add up to enough, that's for sure. And um, they help a little bit, but, you know, we need need 
massive transformations of our whole way we get our energy and use it to make things and uh, and getting at that you know requires a massive transformation to green sources of energy that won't put carbon dioxide into the air mm-hmm. and and you're right I mean I agree I agree that the over the next uh, you know 50 years or so the disasters from climate change are just going to get worse and worse and uh, threaten all sorts of terrible upheaval and s- around the world. And that's going to continue to get worse even more than 50 years, you know, for yeah. a couple of hundred years, I'd say, if, if we don't really rein in the, the carbon dioxide we're putting in the air and and also, uh, methane is a potent yeah. greenhouse gas, and that one of the biggest sources of methane. Methane around the world are uh, animal husbandry. I mean, yeah. you know, cattle and and in particular. Uh, yeah. So we have to switch over to a you know vegan and plant-based kind of diet. Well, the um, World Health Organization. I don't know about ten years ago said that um, uh, factory farming was and, and animal husbandry was was providing half of the greenhouse uh, greenhouse gases. I don't know if they still say that, but but they said we have to move to um, reduced meat consumption, but but to uh, creating the meat uh, in laboratories. You know, I, 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 I oh yeah. You know, and I'm I'm totally in favor of that. I know it sounds awful, but I th- to me it's preferable than uh, uh, world suicide. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if you think about it logically, yeah, um, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, although some people don't think too far ahead into the future about all this. Uh, that's right. Uh, I I also uh, am skeptical about how well democracy can deal with it because it's not only seems to me big corporations that will uh, often and and the biggest ones do uh, everything possible to block any change uh, in uh, you know the way things are going, but. People will vote for short-term profit and and uh, do and and don't want to sacrifice. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of a lot of people are uh, so stressed out about that that they, <clears throat> you know, just den- deny that a problem exists. Yeah, a lot they, of they that. have a kind of uh, you know psychological reaction to the stress of it all, and then just. Uh, deny that it exists or even demonize, you know, those who are trying to make the changes. Right. Right. Um, that, right. Kind, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing goes on a lot. And of course the big fossil fuel and beef and other corporations are exerting tremendous uh, political power, uh, as you say, and issuing, uh, and supporting the denialism, yeah, because it's in their profits to do so. Yeah, but I, I think there's hope. You know, like, I mean, the transformation. There's a lot of people. And the concern is, is still, nonetheless, you know, it's still growing a lot among like uh, like the Democrat people identify as the Democrats or independents. You know, they're getting more and more concerned. Yeah, and uh, they won the election, you know, and so Biden is now in the U.S. is committed to uh, doing what he can. Yeah, I I heard Gary's uh, uh, the, the the press conference for the twenty seventh, uh, which oh is you did Thursday. Yeah, I can I get all the press conferences. I can get anything, uh, and. Uh, you know, I'm I'm listening to what Carrie says, and it's all good, but 
You know, the Democrats just don't match the Republicans in messaging. So here, here's what Kerry's saying, you know, that we have an existential threat. Well, yeah. that, that's not going to get through to a lot of people. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't bite. It doesn't, I mean, what does existential threat mean? What's the, they don't use the word existential. It, you know, they have to use, you know, more common gripping language. And, and Biden's trying to do that, but still, you know, it's very educated people. Uh, whereas Trump knows yeah. how to how to say things that really get to people, you know, some very yeah, bad things are happening and it's going to kill you and your children and you know or something like that. Or if you want to be more accurate, say uh, existential threat means it's a threat to our existence, to our continuation. That that you know, as the yeah. uh, the uh, um, the head of the United Nations said, we are the world now is committing suicide. We have to turn it around. You know, stuff that like gets in there rather than yeah. Uh, and that was Obama's problem too. Is um, and he admitted it. Uh, he didn't sell things well. He he spoke so. He was he had almost had a genteel way of speaking, very dignified and and sort of understated often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you're really putting your finger on the yeah on the difference in uh, delivery there. So hey, um, uh, I I remember I. I want to I want to get off these subjects, but I just want to say one other thing. I tried to touch on earlier. I remember talking to you about you were teaching a course in climate denial or something like that, and and uh, and um, you know showing you know the class was dealing with uh, climate denial uh, literature or publications. And this and that, and you know, sort of picking it apart and figuring out how to deal with it. And you talked about what sort of people tended to gravitate toward that. Do you remember that? Well, I, I always, uh, you know, I, I did have a whole course on climate change that I taught a couple of times, and we went into that subject. I see, that uh, was it, yeah quite a bit yeah the whole i mean the course included other aspects of of climate change and you know did you ever see the movie merchants of doubt no I, well i don't think so sounds good well it's a it's about climate change denialism and also tobacco cancer denialism uh-huh from the big from the big companies yeah i mean what uh, idiots the yeah. congress are to Pull the heads of the big tobacco companies up and ask them if tobacco is, uh, nicotine is addicted, you know, and like the heads of the five big yeah. companies. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I mean, gee. Huh. Yeah. I mean, when, listen, when I was a little kid, you know, back in the 50s, people knew that, I mean, I would hear it all the time that, Nicotine was addictive and it caused cancer, or at least smoking caused yeah. cancer. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, like people would call a tobacco, call cigarettes like coffin nails or something. Cancer sticks. I, I, I knew yeah, a girl. I was over at her house, and they had cigarettes in a container marked "cancer sticks." At that, what year Boy. is that? That's 1960. So when I was 15, wow. I stole a, yeah. I stole a, a, a fifth of, a, of a bourbon from them. Oh, God. Oh uh, my God. To this day, I don't even like to smell bourbon from. <laughs> oh, I did that too when I was about that age. <laughs> when I was about 17, I drank a fifth of bourbon or something like that. And man, I could never, I have never touched whiskey since then. Oh, I touched whiskey, just not bourbon. Uh, oh, well, whatever. I don't I, even distinguish them. Hey, did you know, I, I heard, do you know what uh, Biden's drinking history is? 
No. He, I heard him it? say he had never had a drink. How is that possible? Wow. I mean, well, he's Catholic, so you know he's had a little bit <laughs> at church. Uh, at church, yeah. I mean, they have a little sip of wine. But look, we look at look at the presidents we had who didn't drink. Trump, Biden said never had a drink. Trump and Bush both quit drinking because of behavioral problems with it that they recognized. So they were smart. Uh, hmm. All right. Hey, so um, I remember you telling me once, you know, you were in Japan, that you used to lecture on sociology at the college level in Japan, like extemporaneously without notes. Oh, well, I mean, I would prepare my lectures. We had a textbook, you know. Yeah. And and so I would I would prepare my 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 lectures, but I did I lectured taught a whole years course there in political politics comparative politics of the U.S. and Japan and stuff like that in in Japanese, yeah. Yeah, well, that's very impressive. Very impressive. My Japanese definitely. I I gave I gave some talks in Japanese in Japan, but I would have them all written out, and I would read. I would have every line I would have on a single page, it was rather small paper, and I would turn the oh. page, and then I could improvise a little, but I could go right yeah, back right. to it, you know, but. My my, oh, yeah. my Japanese was never fluent. Uh, yeah, I really admire that. That's great. Um, so well, I've lost lost it to some degree. You know, I haven't been using it. I haven't gone back there for a while, and I haven't been using it lately very much, just occasionally. But uh, you know, it was a phase that I went through that I'm glad I was able to <laughs> attain some pre pretty good fluency. Pre Quite a phase. <laughs> I think phase, phase is maybe too light a word for your what in in uh, in, in Japan. Uh, so yeah, you were in Japan and uh, you went to Japan. Did you go before Suzuki Roshi died? Just before he died, yeah. Yeah, you went in seventy one. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, what? Why did you decide to go to Japan? Oh well, I uh, my my dream was to have uh, Doksan with a Zen teacher in the language, in the Japanese language, you know. Yeah. And and try to understand Zen better that way. Yeah, and so, wow, I, that's why I, I did it. You know, I mean, I, I went to Berkeley and majored in Buddhist studies as an undergraduate. Oh, and then as part, part of that, I took the exchange program to Japan to study the language. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I, I entered Berkeley at. When I was uh, in 1970, after I got out of Tassajara and was working for a while in uh, manual labor jobs, carpentry and stuff, and then I decided that I didn't want to spend my life doing that and I'd better go back to college. And so I went to Berkeley and and uh, majored in Buddhist studies with Lou Lancaster and and Robert Bella. Oh, wow. Very good. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and did you know Steve Tipton then? Um, I I don't think I met him at that time, but I, I met him later on. Yeah, yeah. I did a podcast with him. Uh, he's a very close old friend of mine. Um, so, wow. So, you know, Bella was, I, I think of him as like the most prominent sociologist in America. Would, would would you say that's accurate? I mean, Steve talked about who he studied with at 
Harvard at the same, actually with the same degree of praise and admiration. But Bella was oh yeah a very prestigious uh, Did, professor there. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, well, you know, there's so many different sort of sub schools in sociology that um, have their own prominent representatives. But uh -huh. you know, for he was uh, to me, he was the most. Uh, exciting and instructive and inspiring sociologist and in what person what, in general. In, in, all right. Oh, did he have a subset? <laughs> you mean his specialty sort of thing? Yeah. Well, as, uh, what do you mean by his subset? Well, you said that, that there's various schools are types of sociology and they have their representative prominent people and yeah right and so what was his area well i suppose you could mainly call it sociology of religion oh really oh uh, -huh. uh well that's certainly been steve tipton's focus too uh yeah, sociology of religion and sociology of uh, values, like what mm -hmm. drives people to behave in in certain ways. And he did a uh, – Steve Tipton worked with him on a real uh, important uh, book in sociology called Habits of the Heart, mm -hmm. which looked into Americans' basic values and – their, their sense of, uh, particularly their sense of individualism. Mm -hmm. And Steve Tipton and some other of Bella's uh, students collaborated with him on that book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, Steve Tipton first got hold of Bella to do that book. He was sent to Bella. He had the idea for the book with the professor he had at Harvard. I can't re remember uh, who. And, um, yeah, there were like five people or uh, maybe, <laughs> I can't remember, uh, were giving credit yeah. for the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you studied with Dr. Lancaster, who, uh, uh, Lou Lancaster, who uh, also... Uh, is a what would you say a giant in his field? He was he was head of East Asian studies, I think, at UC Berkeley. But I thought of him as head of studying Buddhism at UC Berkeley. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, he could do both. Yeah. 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 And both of them both. had relationships with the uh, Zen Center. Uh, well, you know. Um, Dr. Lancaster, is, uh, he's in his 90s now, and uh, he's living in uh, in uh, Sonoma County. Uh, uh -huh. now, he's not living in Stinson Beach anymore, but he's still he's still at it. Uh, oh, I'd like to yeah, I'd like to get in touch with him. I haven't been in touch with him very very much. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, have, I haven't talked to him for a long time. Yeah. Have you uh, talked with him? I, you know, every once in a while, I, I contact him about something, but mainly I, I leave him alone. I, I think, uh, I mean, he's been so helpful to me through the years. Um, uh, and and I, I did a podcast on Christmas that went up Christmas Day with a Catholic priest who studied with him. And has been in touch with him recently. I can I can certainly help you with that. Um, so you were you were over oh. there studying, and and when you first went to Japan in seventy one, was that with the, this program with the school? Right. Yeah, it was the exchange program from Berkeley. To where? To the uh, ICU, the International Christian University. Where? 
That's in Mitaka, outside of Tokyo. Uh huh. And so, how'd that go? Oh, it was great. You know, uh, I I I just uh, uh, I, I took the, their uh, straight intensive language training course. So the whole year was devoted exclusively to learning Japanese language. Smart and um, very very intensive. And um, we we had a little house, a little apartment near there. Who's we? I had just married. Who's we? Well, I, I had just married Gretchen, mm-hmm. Gretchen Priest, and mm-hmm. um, and then we I took her with me, and mm-hmm. we went there and got this little apartment, and then uh, Bill Shirtless came and lived with us. Oh, I see. I, I, I was going to ask you that. I, I associated the two of you together there, but I didn't know quite how that uh, played out. Oh, so he he came after. Well, yeah, he came in the, just as the program was beginning in, in September mm-hmm. and got it, got into the program, too. Oh. And then we took the program together for the whole year. And he... We just, it was like a, you know, monastic, like when we were together in Tassajara, it was just this monastic discipline. <laughs> I can believe we it. We were just studying Japanese all the time. Wow, well, yeah. You all were both fanatics uh, at Tassajara. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that, a lot of times fanatics are the ones that really, uh, you know, persevere and get into things, uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, look at both of you. I mean, he's like, I remember you saying to me once that Bill is the foremost authority on soybean products in the world and has the largest database on soybeans in the world. And I've been in his home in Walnut Creek. Now, this is 25 years ago, but um, yeah. it was I, back then, it was filled with file cabinets. I mean, that's yeah. my memory. It's probably yeah. exaggerated, but uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's amazing. Well, he became a he became a crusader for saving the world through, you know, vegetarian diet based on soy products. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. his kind of driving ambition. I think about him here because we live in, in Bali. And um, uh, there's a lot of soy products here. And, uh, you know, uh, we also, we get, um, we get, sometimes we get tempeh, miso, and tofu made by Japanese here. In like, oh, totally, oh, yeah. he'd just be told, I mean, like, that are, you know, really into making it the authentic way. Uh, so there's all types of all that here. And uh, I oh, try wow. not to eat too much soy. I, I think, I, I mean, we get plenty of soy here, but I don't think it's good to eat too much soy, especially for males. Really? Yeah, it's got estrogen in it, something like that. And I just heard too oh, many yeah. stories. Uh, and and you know I just think everything should be done in balance. Uh, uh, Ed Brown, I, I have met people who really turned on soy. Ed Brown's one of them felt like it had uh, it was it was it made him too emotional. <laughs> he was very emotional to begin with. And I uh, want yeah. to name a woman at Zen Center had developed problems, she said, because of using soy milk all the time. Uh, she said, it's not soy milk, it's bean juice. And um, I, got, who was, I, can't, I can't remember her name right now. Uh, but um, we've made soy milk here. But mainly we make yeah. uh, almond cashew milk. We use both of them. Yeah, that's what we use now. Yeah. Hey, make it, man. If you make it, it's just so much better than buying it. It's incredible. It's not hard. Oh, really? You make your own almond cashew milk? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not hard. Wow. It's not hard. 
Oh, I can talk to you. I about never it thought later. of that. Oh yeah, it's it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> also, though, we have it. I mean, I developed. You know, I studied it and looked at what different people said. One thing I I found was it's really not necessary to take the skins off the almonds, uh, and uh, which they'll come off. You know, you so you can do that, but it's not necessary. Uh, but you know, once I sort of had it down, I taught our housekeeper how to do it, and she makes three times a week. She makes it for us because it oh, doesn't wow. last. It doesn't last well. Uh, it's, it, it just, oh wow! You just want it for about three days. Uh, but oh. I worry sometimes I have too much. I get, I'm wow. so into yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, all right. Back to you in Japan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I, I want to hear about go your on. life in Bali too, but any, I want to hear about your life in Bali too. It sounds so exotic. Um, uh, well, but you know, exotic anyhow. things are exotic until you've been there a while, and then they're endemic or something, whatever the opposite of that is. <laughs> they're yeah, just right. local. Uh, uh, mainly, I'd say we live in a very small world. Yeah, that's nice, uh, and the people are nice, but uh, enough of that. Uh, so, hey, so you're in Japan. So, uh, so you did a year, uh, or a, uh, you did what two semesters or what of this two, yeah well it's actually a year because it was the preceding summer as well plus two semesters of intensive japanese oh. well i'm just jealous you know <laughs> uh, right very few people get fluent they get what elan said who i was married to when i lived there she said we're conversational uh you know but not fluent right <laughs> well, uh, there's just endless depths of fluency in a language, you know, and I mean, even I run across words I don't know in English sometimes, you know. All the time, and, yeah. I look words up all the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in Japanese, too, you know, I mean, I was, I could read, you know, books about my subject matter, like environmental stuff and sociology and stuff like that pretty easily but when it came to reading a, a Japanese novel you know with all its oh nuanced emotional expressions you know yeah it was just really hard and I had to I would have to look up every you know half the stuff and, yeah um, yeah so I wasn't fluent in that sense you know you, and you, and yeah. yet I mean but I was able to uh you know, talk very fluently in in my in my field of specialty and give these lectures and yeah. things like that. If if I prepared, uh, you know, I I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, there's just different levels of it. Yeah, uh, you know what I do. What I found and it's the same in Indonesia is since it's another language and since I am not fluent, everything is interesting. I would read the junk mail. Um, I'd buy. Yeah. I would buy like a uh, an like piece of electronic equipment or something, and I would read the entire book that came with it. Uh, and <laughs> I thus I would know my equipment better. You know, I got a VCR. You read it in, in Indonesian? No, in in Japanese. Oh yeah, I do it in oh, Indonesian yeah, too. Indonesian's a little easier. Uh, uh, but I do it in Japanese, and people would like be really impressed. But actually, the easiest thing is technical stuff. Yeah, it doesn't have grammar to speak. I mean, Japanese doesn't have a lot of what we think of as grammar to begin with. But technical stuff, it, and then once you get going, it starts repeating itself. You know. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. more mechanical. Uh, yes. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, but so but when you get into the start to get into the heart of people's you know e emotions and symbolic uh, meanings that they associate yeah. meaning in their life with, you know, I mean, like in Japan, you know, I mean, talking about 
the emperor system or you know the right wing militia there or um i mean buddhism or something and i mean some people know a lot about it and they care a lot about it. others don't but yeah uh, those kind of things are so deep in the culture you know and yeah uh, you have to really uh open your heart up to empathize with where they're at about that kind of thing yeah yeah, well, you're talking about difficult stuff there. Did did you uh, run into uh, uh, like people not believing you could speak Japanese? Oh, sure, just like you would too, all the time, you know. <laughs> and I'd be <laughs> speaking along in Japanese, and they wouldn't, they couldn't hear, even hear it, you know, because they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you know. I was talking to a guy who grew up in Japan. He's actually Japanese. And he had uh, like a, a Caucasian mother and a Japanese father or vice versa. And he looked completely oh. Western. But he grew up wow. in Japan speaking Japanese just like everybody else. And he experienced that. He said yeah. he still experiences it, that people... But, and he's speaking it, and with me, I could say, well, I, you know, I had a heavy American accent and would be making mistakes, so you know. But with him, he's speaking it without an accent, <laughs> just like they do, and they'd say, I don't speak English or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I just can't believe it. It's so racially um, typed there, you know, with the relative relative homogeneity of the culture that there's a kind of density I call it of of Japanese culture where people are associate um the the physical type and the language and the schooling and habits and personality type and what you eat and you know mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. other things um and it's all one package, you know. It's like in the United States, we have so much pluralism and different people speaking English. We don't think anything of it, but yeah, there. Yes, yeah. Uh, that that's true. I would tell people there, and I would tell people here that you know English is an international language, and the way you're speaking it is fine. It's you know, uh, it works. It's yeah, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I we we had we had a lot of we were we taught English, you know, all under the table, uh, or mm -hmm. almost all under the table, uh, and immigration knew it. We had a guy in immigration that really took care of us, just made sure we didn't go too far, and we didn't want to because we oh. we met, we didn't want to work too many hours or anything, but. Uh, uh, there was uh, a young woman, and she's still living there now, uh, and married to Japanese, and uh, she was teaching for us and took over some of our classes when we left. And she w one thing she would do is she would say, and she was blonde, right? And yeah. she would say, talk about eye cl color in an English fashion. And then she would say, what color eyes do I have? And she said, everybody would say blue. And... She'd say, well, my eyes are brown, just like yours. And they go, really? <laughs> <laughs> she said that would happen yeah. uh, pretty regularly. But, um, yeah, uh, the stereotype, the yeah. blue-eyed foreigner. Yeah, yeah. My eyes turned blue in Japan. Maybe it was their... Uh, they they were more hazel, they called it, like little spots of blue and green and gray and stuff when I went over. So my, my eyes were officially hazel when I went over, and when I came back and had to get a new driver's license, the guy looked at the forum and then looked up at me and said, what, did your eyes change color? And I said, yes. Seriously? Yeah. And you know what I found out is, is uh, that happens. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> so was hey, it the, the diet or was it? No, no, the barrage no, no. It's really hazel eyes can can become blue. I mean, mine did. And uh, I think and, you were just you're so empathic. You know, you were just responding to the barrage of expectations coming from the Japanese. <laughs> yeah, that's that's well, that's you just that's what I let in. More, you know. <laughs> But anyway, all right. Hey, hmm. back to back to the subject. Yeah. So you're in Japan. Yeah. You had that year of intense Japanese, which I admired so much. And uh, so what happened? Well, then I uh, went to uh, become uh, the student of of Haksan Roshi. Hey, you know, say his Nozhi. own name because. Uh, Mainly, we don't say Hakusan for him. No? No, we say Noiri. Oh, Noiri Kojun, yeah. Is that different? Oh. Noiri Kojun. Oh, who? Oh, Hakusan isn't Noiri. No, it's the same person. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in uh, when I heard about him, uh, when I heard about him from Suzuki Roshi, when when I put him in Quick and Cucumber, uh, uh, with uh, on the Terabest site, and he was uh, a student of him, it's always no eerie. Uh, oh, well, that's his official. I mean, that's his family name, you know. Right, right. So Hakusan, but not his Buddhist name. Right, right, right. Well. Suzuki is his family name. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, Suzuki so, Shundu. But, yeah. But Haksan uh, Nori, Nori Kojun Roshi. And so he had the name Haksan and Kojun. And oh, now that you mentioned it, I'm not sure how those two related to each other. But... Um, we always would call him Haksan Roshi at the temple. Oh, what, all right. How did you How did you meet him? Well, before I went to Japan, I asked Suzuki Roshi, you know, who I could study with in Japan. Yeah. And he he said I could study with Nori Roshi. And so when I went there, um, after I'd acquired a little fluency. You know, we went to visit him, and then after the the university training there of the language was done in June, you know, we I, I went to uh, be a temple disciple at his little country temple, and then I had uh, I had Gretchen stay in a woman's Buddhist monastery in Kyoto for three months while I was training at his temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, where was his temple? Oh, it's in uh, Shizuoka. Yeah. Just... Uh, it's not far from little, Rinso uh, Inn. No. Right. I'm not sure now. I forget what you know the the, the distances. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's just a little village uh, temple there. Um, nice little temple, and and uh, you know the practice consisted of uh, listening to his hours long lectures every day. Every day wow. about Dogen. Wow. Just yeah. And then I would be cleaning the toilets or, you know, making food or doing whatever. Was there Zazen? Uh not that much Zazen. It was mostly listening to his lectures. Hmm. You know, uh Suzuki Roshi talked about him, as, and he was 10 years junior to Suzuki. 
Uh, but uh, he, he, he talked about him and Niwa. Uh, but Noiri was really the one he thought was, well, like he sent you to him. And he had asked him to come to Tassajara, but um, mm, I don't think that would have worked uh, from what I hear. I never met him, which I'm sorry. Uh, I, you know, Hoitsu, he was Hoitsu's teacher too. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's what Hoitsu told me, you know, Suzuki's son. Oh. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I asked Hoitsu, oh, back in two, in 1994, I think, if I could meet him. And Hoitsu said, I can't meet him anymore. <laughs> uh, but um, oh boy! And and when I was in uh, in uh, let's see what year was that? In in eighty uh, eight when I was in the Soto Zen International Temple, just trying, just starting out with uh, and Katagiri was there and visiting and and Ekai, uh, Ekai, Ekai. Uh, Kore Matsu. He's down in New Zealand, Australia. Now he went there years ago. Whoa. Uh what was that place called? Shogoji. Uh in down near Kumamoto in Kyushu. When I was there, there, there were very few of us. There was like eight of us total. Uh Noiri was regarded as the most prestigious uh Soto Zen uh priest by them wow. uh, uh, anyway uh, he had quite a reputation yeah well I became his uh, you know householder disciple uh -huh. and took the the householder tokudo ah. with him yeah and so got part of became part of that lineage mm. and um, so I was able to go and see him you know and um, I did a few times but I must say that I didn't fully uh, appreciate it I mean it it was very stressful to be in that temple and I felt very uh frustrated and um, you know there wasn't Zazen going on very much and and after a couple months of it, I just felt um, very un, un unfulfilled and unsatisfied mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember like um, lying in my sleeping bag sleeping and then <clears throat> uh, masturbating and thinking, oh, I just want to get out of here, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. And, and, and Gretchen was in this woman's uh, monastery, which was uh, from the other uh, Zen sect, not Rinzai or Soto, but the, Obaku. the, the third one. Obaku, yeah. Yeah. And um, so I got her, and then around December, I, I decided I'd had enough of that. And um, he wanted me to become a regular full monk, you know, and I didn't want to do that. Yeah. And because I wanted to see more of the world and explore it in my own way. And mm -hmm. so we took off and and we went around the world and we went to uh, on a shoestring and went to Thailand and studied with uh, the Vipassana master there. Oh, really? Uh, in the, Where? In the town of Ubon. Uh, in Ubon, uh, Ajahn Chah, his name is. Oh, yeah. He was very well and, known. Now, r remind me of where Ubon, uh, Ubon is. Well, we it's you, you take uh, the train from Bangkok and you go 
east to the eastern border, right near uh, Laos. Yeah. And you go east. To, east. You go east. I yeah, east it is, isn't it? Yeah. Toward and toward America. To get to the, toward America. <laughs> well, if you go that direction, you get there. Yeah. Um, uh huh. But towards uh, towards Japan, the direction of Japan. Huh. Well, yeah. that's interesting. But yeah, and it's on the Laotian border, and that was in 1972. And we used to sit there in these little huts on raised stilts at four in the morning and meditate. And then there would be this gigantic roar, and everything would shake. And I wondered what it was, you know. And it turned out it was the B-52 bombers taking off from the U.S. Air Force Base there to go and do secret bombing runs over Laos, according to, you know, Nixon's orders. Yeah. The secret war. Yeah. Yeah, terrible, a, terrible. Yeah, so it was just this strange contrast. Um, but it was a beautiful, otherwise, you know, it was a beautiful, idyllic, uh, monastery there and and that was very nice and I mean it's a long story but then we went to uh, India and studied with the Gretchen's uh, teacher who was a member of the Sikh re- uh, religion uh-huh where taught where? the Sikh the Sikh uh, well he had an ashram in Delhi and then we went up to uh, Rajpur in the north. Is, is that in Punjab? A mansion, a in house. Punjab? Uh, where? In Punjab? Uh-huh. Not in, it was not quite as far as Punjab, but, you know, uh, up in that direction in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh-huh. And we would meditate there for several weeks and, you know, I was trying to understand different styles of meditation. Oh, that's great! And how they, yeah, how they differed from each other. And you know, I was really surprised to find how much the the Sikh tradition you know, coming from, you know, basically coming from the ancient Hindu yogic tradition. Yeah. You know, emphasized this notion of uh, inner light and sound. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to meditate on inner light and sound mm-hmm. and let the consciousness of the world melt away. And then you sort of transcend body consciousness. Mm-hmm. And so this was a method of meditation that was totally different from the Zen meditation, which was, you know, quiet stillness in the present moment with mm-hmm. your eyes half open. And so I was just so fascinated by that that medita- I thought meditation was all the one and the same, you know, and uh-huh. so but it was also different. It was mm. fascinating. Mm. Mm. And after that, after spending about three months there, then we we and I became his uh, initiate as well. And learn the the inner uh, mantra, you know, that you repeat and uh, meditate on, and and listening to the sound and light. And, and then we left there, and we went to England, and went to uh, Brother David's monastery in Northern England. Oh. Oh, yeah, far out. Yeah, it was, it was this ancient monastery, uh, and he welcomed us there. Uh, Benedictine, huh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then in the morning we got up, and we attended mass in the chapel, Gretchen and I. And then afterwards she said, "Well, this is the first time in 1600 years that a woman has entered the the chapel." Ha ha ha! That is great. <laughs> but he said it's okay. <laughs> huh? That's great. Um, you know, uh, Diane, 
uh, you know, my first wife, Diane Goldschlag, she and I stayed at uh, Komodli Monastery in Big Sur, and they thought that was the first time a woman had stayed there. I mean, they just broke the rule for us. Uh, wow. That was, oh, I don't know, cool. like 1973. Uh, wow, so you're up at, with Brother David there. Huh, far out. He's in Argentina yeah. now. Is he really? Yeah. Yeah. I Wow. I I I think he might want to leave at some point and and just stay because of the virus. And he's in his 90s. Oh. Dick Baker, you know, sees him sometime with and, 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 and Dick saw uh brother David and Vanya, you know, in Switzerland. Uh and uh uh then Brother David and Vanya are very close. And, you know, Brother David's Austrian and Vanya's Austrian. And uh, Dick said, he, 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 you know, it was hard for him to keep up with Brother David. He was like in his 90s, you know, zipping up the, you know, very steep mountainside there. And, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Go on, go cool. on. That's really neat. You're there. Yeah, so then finally we made it back to uh, Berkeley, and I started taking classes again, and graduated from there in '74 with a, you know, a major in Buddhist studies, with my thesis advisor being uh, um, Robert Bella, and uh, for my senior project I translated the sermons of Sawaki Kodo Roshi, who we had, you know, discovered about while we were in Japan. And, oh, um, far had met out. some of his disciples. Hey, well, 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 are they available? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, um, in in uh, Paris, in, uh, they had, you know, started the Zen movement there with um, under the guidance of Sawaki Koto's uh, disciple, Deshimaru. Um, Deshimaru, yeah. And so then, the leader of the of the Paris Zendo found out that I had done this translation, and no one else had translated Sawaki Koto. So he, I sent it to him, and he translated it into French, and it's been circulating there for the last twenty, thirty years, or however how long. Um, well, where's the English? So, where's the English available? The ink. You? Hey, yeah, I have it somewhere. I, I want to put it on cute.com. Come on, that's very important. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, yeah it's the it still is the only translation of his work into English, I think. Hey, can I publish it? I've got a cute press. I don't promote things. I just, but I could make it where people could get a book of it. Sure, I'd love to make it available. Yeah, uh, and I don't. Back in 1974, I there's no money in it. It was just, you know, I don't see any money from the press. Uh, oh no, God, no! I mean, I it was just a labor of love, anyhow. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I'm a few thousand behind in uh, what I've done. I put out a book called A Brief History of Tassahara. Have you seen that? I've heard of it. Yeah, maybe he was. Yeah, I, I was looking at cube dot com and I saw your a notice about it. Uh, but um, yeah, all right, go on, go on. Um, oh well, just uh, yeah, I have to locate it. Um, I haven't looked at it for a long time because now it was almost fifty years ago when I did that. Well, you are certainly um, lacking ambition not to have uh, published that. Because he's pretty well known. Uh, oh yeah, well, you know, I, it was uh, it was a book on his lectures on the Song of Enlightenment. Oh, wonderful! Shodoka. Yeah, yeah, but unfortunately, I I didn't have time uh, to translate the entire book. So I, you know, it's like the first third or something so it's not 
like I couldn't claim, you know, publishing it as a full translation of the whole book. Uh huh. All right, whatever it is, we'll take it. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to look it up if I can find it still wherever it is. Oh yeah, you got to find yeah. it. Come on. Uh, all right. Well, all right. That that is very cool. That is very cool. Uh, so uh, let's see. Where were we last? You were in you were in England. What happened? Oh no, well, no. Then, we then went you went back. back. No, and... no. You already, you went back and got your sociology degree. Oh, and that was no. It was a, it was a religious studies degree actually. Yeah. Oh, religious studies. Uh huh. With Bella. Yeah. Yeah. In in Buddhist studies, actually, yeah. Uh huh. And then what did you do? And that was what you said, seventy four. Seventy four, yeah. Well, Bella liked me so much, and he, you know, I took his course on the sociology of religion and wrote about doing uh, a paper on doing Rohatsu Session at Aheji, and you know, talked about the symbolic dimensions of it and different things. And he, he, he loved it so much. He said, kid, you got potential. You should go to graduate school. Uh huh. And, and I said, well, duh, I never thought of that. And, um, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you should go to Harvard. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a letter of recommendation there. Cause I used to teach there. And, um, I said, well, you know, the people you've been teaching me about, the sociologists like Talbot Parsons and others, really intrigued me. And so I, I would like to go and study further. So he got me to apply there, and and uh, I got in, and and uh, you know, did a a master's degree and regional studies there in a year and then went into the PhD program in sociology and that was in 1975 then and finally you know graduated with my PhD in 1982. Oh wow wait a minute that's seven years later what's happening in all those seven years? Oh well um, you know I spent about four years studying sociological methods and theory and wow. different schools of sociology and stuff. Wow. I would be uh, incapable. And then I went I'm incapable of doing that. That's really impressive. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> well, it was interesting stuff, you know, um, <clears throat> to me. But then I, I wanted to put together my interest in protest movements. You know, like you, I, I in the 60s, I had been in the civil rights movement. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, I I know you were in that because you were listed in Doug McAdams' book on um Freedom Summer. Oh yeah. Uh I I had uh, you know, I I wrote I I've, I've written a whole thing about it. I'll probably do podcasts on it called uh uh Freedom Songs, uh my journey through 1964. But um my uh, involvement was nothing compared to most people's. Uh, it was just a matter of months, uh, and I was kicked out of uh, kicked out of it for causing too much trouble, getting people to stay up late and sing and drink and and making fun of them. And uh, so it was a very serious movement. But uh, anyway, it was great. Uh, then I went to SDS. Yeah, that's wonderful. For, yeah, I went to SDS for a while, uh, but then then I became, you know, a hippie and got into uh, uh, pot and all that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did that kind of stuff too in the sixties. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. But uh, so you're you're at Harvard and you're studying. Uh, you're studying what here? Well, sociology and studying Japanese society and studying uh -huh. politics of and environmental stuff. And um, then I decided to go and uh, do my PhD thesis by doing uh, in-depth uh, field work 
on an environmental protest movement in Japan. Mm. Mm. So I spent about two and a half years living in southern Japan in this community that was protesting against the government that wanted to build a big polluting factory. And I was studying where, where? that protest movement. Where? Oh, that was in the prefecture of, of Oita, which is just at the end of the Inland Sea. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, interviewing everybody and uh, on all sides of the issue and really trying to understand uh, their different points of view, you know, why they wanted to build the factory and why they wanted to protest against it and and what did the environment or was, was anybody concerned about the environment or what was their take on it all? Hmm. Did they, were they successful? Well, that particular movement, um, they succeeded in delaying the building of the factory for about 10 years, mm-hmm. tying it up in the courts and tying it up in protests. And mm-hmm. the governor, you know, didn't want to just flat out use the cops or the military or something and put them down like they might in some countries. Yeah. They rather wanted to give them due process and and everything. So they managed to delay it. And then after the end of the delay, by that time, it was uh, around 1980. I just came in on the tail end of the whole process. And then... Uh, the, the, the factories had decided that they didn't want to build their their polluting uh, factories inside Japan anymore because it made more sense to build them in Indonesia or someplace, you know, right. Malaysia or someplace. Right, right, right. Because you didn't have to face all these protesters. Right, right, yeah. And, and uh, I remember um, on a, a documentary about you know, terrible fires going on in Kalimantan. Uh, I mean, you know, significant amounts of, you know, putting out more carbon dioxide than anybody else in the world, burning down uh, uh, jungle to plant, uh, you know, uh, oil palm. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the military guy who's in charge of protecting the forest said, well, what we can, what can we do? This is progress. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. And, oh, God. Yeah. More, go on. Yeah. 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 So that was what the the field work was about, you know. And, and uh, I just interviewed, like, took down about 500 different interviews and wow. detailed notes on all of them and, you know, and then collated the whole thing together into a kind of multidimensional picture of what was going on there. Wow. And wrote a book about it eventually. I wrote my PhD thesis on it and graduated in 82. Mm. And uh, later, about 15 years later, I finally published a book on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, car- you know, I carried that interest in the '60s social protests. Like, I was just in the civil rights movement, you know, peripherally too. But I did go down south for a while and and uh, organized the core chapter in the north and was uh, a core. Did in, you say uh, core? Yeah, core. Wow. Um, where in the north? In Fairfield, Connecticut. Oh, that's very interesting because I I think of CORE as being all black people. I In Chicago, uh, there was a CORE group in the south side that would bring me there. I'd be the only white person. I'd be the only white person once I got off the subway or whatever it was, yeah, the train. 
they bring me there because I had a guitar and I could play all the freedom songs and stuff. It was cool, man. <laughs> wow. Uh, and cool. I had a, I had a good friend good you. from uh, the the long hot summer training camp at uh, Oxford, Mississippi. No, Oxford, Ohio. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I met a really good friend there uh, who was a black guy who lived in the South Side. He was a photographer. And uh, I'd go visit him there. And, oh, oh, he and I got along. Oh, God. He was older. Oh, we had fun. We had so much fun. But wow. it disturbed people what we do. We we did a whole thing where, where uh, he was the white overlord and I was the black guy shuffling <laughs> and I mean, I was like when we go into places and he get he go, Get over there, boy <laughs> and, so, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh uh both of us were just anyway, anyway, I loved him. He was great. I even wrote me oh, that's when, great. when I came to California, he and I corresponded some all right, wait a minute. So, uh, so you went back and got your PhD, but then what did you do then? You're still with Gretchen, right? Yeah, yeah, I was still with Gretchen, and um, we 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 had bought this land in Vermont, and so I got a job at uh, a State University of New York in Plattsburgh as an assistant professor. I was teaching there and commuting between Plattsburgh and, and Vermont so that she could live on our land in Vermont. And we did that for about two years, but it was, it was really stressful, but we built, we built a house there in, on that land in Vermont. And, and, uh, and, and then, uh, but our relationship was really not going well. And, um, yeah, so, and my relationship to the job was not going well either. So, uh, I applied to a, uh, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan called uh, the, the, the Society of Fellows, or we were junior fellows. So, I was accepted into that for three, it was a three year position where you mostly do research. Mm. And in Ann, in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. yeah, and and so I got that, and I got out of that job in Plattsburgh, and but that meant I had to go, and I lived by myself in a little, you know, on a on a shoestring budget, in a little free, uh, a little free walk up apartment, and um, or in a little cheap rental house sending most of my money back to Gretchen to take care of our two children. And, um, but I spent three years there, you know, teaching about Japan and politics and, and a little bit and studying and writing, working on my PhD thesis more to try to turn it into a book mm -hmm. for three years. And, and then I got a job out here at Minnesota after that. Hmm. Did you go back to Japan to live any or be or, or visit or? Yeah, well, after in '86, you know, I I brought Gretchen and the kids out to Minnesota, and then and then I got involved in another project studying Japan uh, in comparison to Germany and the U.S. And we were uh, implementing a a kind of a special survey. Of Japanese poli labor politics, so I went to Japan for two years and uh, carried that out in uh, '87 or '88 through '90, mm -hmm. and then uh, in 1990, though Gretchen finally had enough and divorced me, and um, she went back to the land in Vermont, you know, where she founded. A Soto Zen temple, you know, and became a Soto Zen priest herself. And in in what lineage? Um, she she uh, is the disciple of uh, 
Tanaka Shinkai. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Now, uh, 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 tell us who he is. Oh, well, Tanaka Shinkai is, he was the, uh, the priest, uh, he was a kind of a disciple of, of Noe Roshi. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was, we met him when he was the priest of, uh, Saikoji, which was a temple outside of, of Kyoto. And, and, well, I first met him when he was the, uh, master of the dorm, um, at the Soto headquarters in, in Tokyo, you know, where they have that, uh, meditation center and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, you don't mean Shumuncho. I don't know what the term is. Uh -huh. but he was in charge of the young, younger monks there in the dormitory. And uh -huh. when I was sitting there, I met him and we got involved with him. And he's a very energetic young priest at that time. And we loved him very much. And he had a really good reputation for being a person for Westerners to study with. Yeah, right. And and he, he became the uh the um head of um you know not Aheji but the inner the temple behind Aheji that's the real hard practice one. Oh. Hmm. What's the name of that one? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's an inner temple there, or further back in the mountains that is really? real dedicated uh, to real hard practice. Yeah, I, 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 I can't remember. And, and so then, that was after we met him, you know, some quite a bit later. And so then Gretchen, when she uh, divorced me after 1990, she went... And after the kids got old enough um, and went off to college, then she started, she went there for a couple of years and uh, practiced with him there mm. and, um, and then became a Zen priest. Mm. And so she's running the temple there in Vermont now as a Zen priest. Really? And what's the temple's name? Yeah. Uh, Shao Shan, Shao Shan Ji. Wow, sounds sort of or, Chinese. Shao Shan. Oh, Shao Shan is the Chinese pronunciation. Yeah. Um, what's the? I forget the Japanese pronunciation. <laughs> uh, uh, um, that's funny. Um, and was when when did you meet Gretchen? Oh, I, I met Gretchen and, you know, I, I dropped out of college in, after a semester in 61 and got involved in the civil rights movement and different things. And then was, was bouncing around and um, was working in a factory and, and uh, ended up uh, going about two years later, going to Goddard College in Vermont for a semester, mm. which is an interesting experimental college kind of thing. And she was there. She had just come up there and met there in 1964. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, so what happened then? Okay. Well, I was kind of a wild child and, and, uh, open to new experiences. And at that time in 64 LSD started appearing at the uh, Goddard college. And I took some and uh, Gretchen took some and we experimented with it and um, ended up uh, getting asked to leave Goddard college after the first semester and come back when we were in better shape. <laughs> and, um, so after that I uh, Gretchen and I went separate ways and she went into the ashram 
in Vermont for seven years. What which ashram? Was dedicated to what? this. Go on. The ashram that was dedicated to this Sikh teacher in India, Kirpal Singh. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. And then I went down to New York and uh, started to practice at the, my first formal Zen practice at the Zen Study Society with Edo Roshi and actually Haku and Yasutani Roshi was down there at that time. So what year was that? That was in 64 or 60, let's see, I guess it was uh, the spring of 65. So, so, and he was called Tyson then, uh, right? Yeah. And so, right. so he was there in 65 in New York. Hmm. He's in study. Yeah. All right. He had just come, you know, and had an apartment. And then after that, he got a, a, a larger uh, practice place. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. All right, so how'd that go? Well, you know, I mean, Yasutani's teaching was more Soto-style teaching, a softer, you know, follow your breath, sit quietly. But Tyson was coming from Rinzai, you know, Mm -hmm. and he was much more uptight, and driving and attain enlightenment uh, type of approach. And it was uh, kind of confusing. And also then he was uh, had his uh, sexual thing going with um, some women there. Um, yeah, always. Which later, you know, he... Huh? Always. Yeah. Yeah, he became well known for that. Um, yeah. But uh, so after about a year and a half there, well, I was uh, I, I was uh, Hakuin Hakuin Yasutani's uh, jisha. You know, I just would make his oatmeal and tea in the bre- for breakfast, mm-hmm. and was living there, and then. Uh, while I was working during the daytime as a conscientious objector over at the hospital. Oh, uh uh-huh. Yeah, so I didn't, you know, against the Vietnam War. Yeah. um, Because I had a Quaker background, so I could, I easily became a conscientious objector, Mm. CO. Mm -hmm. And so at that time I was doing that, plus living at the Zendo or living in a, in an apartment in the Lower East Side and stuff and um, doing, I was an oil painter at the time and interested in art. Oh. And then, but then Suzuki Roshi and David Baker came. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Dick Baker. Yeah. (laughs) Dick Baker uh, and Suzuki Roshi came and um, where they were looking for people to come to Tassajara. Yeah. So I said, I'm not, sign me up. So they came and, um, where? Where did you see them? To the Zen Studies Society in New York. Yeah, you mean they came to Zen Studies and said, we're trying to take uh, yeah, your students away to come with us? Well, they they were there, and they gave a, a talk or something, and they told us about founding Tassajara. So I yeah. don't know what they were trying to attract students, but I just said, hey, that's what I want. I want to sign me up. Uh-huh. And so um, Vic Baker went back to California and talked to the draft board in California and got them to say it was okay for me to, for my alternative service. And I still had a year remaining on that. And it was okay to be a monk at Tassajara because I would be the fire warden and yeah. prevent the monks from setting fire to the national forest. Yeah, and so that was my that was my conscientious objector alternative service for a year. Yeah, while I was at Tassajara. Yeah, I remember when you arrived. That was before the first practice period. Am I right? Uh, I'm not sure. It was. What when when was it? I think October. 
Oh, it was after. All right. October of yeah. 67. I think it was after the first practice After period. the first practice period. I still remember. I met you uh, out on the back porch behind the Zendo and by the kitchen. And you had your hands in Gasho and were looking reverently at the moon. Standing there. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, by the coffee well, and Papa tea Harley. machine. By the coffee and tea machine. You were probably there to yeah. get some coffee or tea, but took a minute out for oh. some uh, uh, moon gazing. Yeah. Uh, well, Tafahara taught me about nature, you know. I'd never known about nature before. Oh, wow. Wow. So, so uh, how was that? Oh, it was just wonderful, you know. I mean, I was a city boy and had, you know, I mean, had not had. I mean, when at Goddard, there was a beautiful natural area too, but you know, Tassajara is smack dab in the middle of the Ventana primitive area there, and dozens of miles away from the nearest habitation and so or at least 17 miles or something and um, you know it's just the primitive area and it's just amazing just intense nature yeah and just gradually you know sitting there and gradually becoming more and more aware of the intensity of nature yeah Hmm. Indeed. Yeah, the natural world. So, how did you like the 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 breakfast there? The breakfast? Huh? The practice. The practice? Yeah. Oh. Well, that was it. Was just a godsend, you know. I mean, so to speak, it was like night and day difference from the Zen Studies Society, which had been so focused on fierce focus on attaining enlightenment, you know, and uh -huh. like kind of like fierce focus on koan, koan practice or something mm -hmm. under Tyson. Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden with Suzuki Roshi, it was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, you know, it was like the difference between the, a diamond and, and gold, I always thought of it. You know, a mellow gold quality uh -huh. with Suzuki Roshi uh -huh. of softness and uh, waiting and receptivity and balance. And it took years for me to unwind after the initial Tyson training. Mm. I remember even after after Tassahara, after I had left Tassahara, after about 15 months or so being there. It's gold. Hey, I love that. That is very cool. Uh, so go on. Yeah. And Suzuki Roshi, you know, and, and, and then, like, when it finally got through to me, it was like I was sitting in – the empty or the front room in in Zen Center, city center, um, after getting out of Tassajara. And I don't know if you remember Paul Provasoli. Oh, yes. And Jerry Pro. Yes. Paul and Jerry Provasoli. Yes. Yeah. And we were sitting there, just sitting there together. And, and, and then he said to me, the door opens inward. Who you know, said? Who talking about said? how he was pushing and pushing and not making any progress in Zazen. Who said that? And, and Paul Provasoli said, the door opens inward. Yeah. And I thought, wow. You know, all this pushing that I've been trained to do with Tyson really isn't the way to go. Yeah. There were so many things with Suzuki Roshi that just 
you know, we 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 action slowly absorb the Dharma. Yeah, there's so many things with Suzuki Roshi. Yeah, such as. Oh well, like, um, one time, um, a guy uh, was it Alan? Was it Alan Duchovny? Um, I'm not sure if that was his name or not, but he was a friend of Ed Brown's, and he worked in the kitchen, and he smoked. Alan Winter. And he, Alan Winter. Okay, yeah, Alan Winter. And. And he asked Suzuki Roshi how he could stop smoking, and Suzuki Roshi said, "Don't try to stop. Just every time you smoke, be fully, fully carefully observe what you're doing." Hmm. And, and that was like, wow, you know, it's so different of an approach to life. Yeah. There's a like a trust in you know, natural health and natural process instead of this use of the will to try to force things to happen. Right. Right. Yeah. And, right. And that was evident in so many things, you know, that he did. And sensing this natural process Mm. Or like he said, you know, you don't have to try to get enlightened. You just practice, and it's like walking in the mist, and eventually you'll get wet. Yeah. Like, I was really hung up about sex, and I used to masturbate. Um, and um, But I, I didn't get involved with any of the women there because I was trying to be sort of celibate and just do my practice, but I ended up masturbating a lot. And so I went to Doksan with Suzuki Roshi and he said, well, what do you enjoy doing the most here at Tassahara? And I told them uh, masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> so honest. <laughs> so honest. <laughs> And and he said, well, um, take that energy, and it's he said it's like a flute, and if you put water in a flute, and you stand it on end, and you put water in a flute, the the water will run out the holes at the bottom. So what you want to do is stop up that hole, those holes, and then the water will rise up to the top. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, you know, I sort of understood him as saying I should kind of restrain that masturbation and, and let that energy rise up in a kind of kundalini kind of thing. So he wasn't very successful because I was <laughs> like addicted <laughs> to, ma- to masturbation and um, couldn't couldn't stop it. Mm-hmm. And, Later on, like just like a couple of years ago, I finally started uh, serious, you know, psychoanalysis, Freudian style psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. and 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 that's been really really helpful in in getting at things which are buried in the subconscious, which. You know, I sort of could intuit a little bit through Zazen, but could never really get at. Mm. And a, a lot of it has to do with sexuality. And um, like the expression of sexuality and the fe- feelings of sexuality. And like my psychoanalyst said that, you know, that Suzuki Roshi's advice in that case was not very good advice, he didn't think, because, uh, you know, that sexual energy is such a powerful thing. Yeah. Yeah. That you can't really stop it up that way. Yeah. Yeah. So... So... 
well, after I got out of Tassajara, then I had a couple of girlfriends, but, you know, um, had some sexual expression. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So what else happened with Suzuki Roshi? Like, uh, <clears throat> oh, like we were working on the hauling stones and putting them into the wall that would become the new kitchen there. You mm-hmm. know, building up the stone wall, and someone. Someone else who was working around on the wall found this uh, kind of crooked rock and managed to fit it in in a very clever and artistic way. And Suzuki Roshi came around and the the, the guy pointed pointed out how he'd fit this rock in there so cleverly. And Suzuki Roshi said something like, "Oh, it looks." You know, it looks intentional or, you know, something where it was like too much thought had gone into it. Hmm. Yeah. See, but when, but um, also another thing he's pointing out to the guy, because the same thing happened to him with his teacher, is he proudly showed his teacher something and his teacher just totally put him down. And I thought, what a terrible thing to do to a kid, a little kid there is all proud of noticing something. But, you know, that's sort of Japanese way. So I think, but maybe Suzuki was responding more to the guy's pride. And uh, if, he well, hadn't, if he hadn't said anything, uh, Suzuki would, might not have uh, noticed that it was intentional. Oh, yeah. Or oh, too yeah. intentional. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But hard to say. Interesting comment. Yeah. Oh, there's just so many little interactions with him. Mm hmm. Um, or like when later at City Center, when Gretchen and I got married, he he made a beautiful scroll. Uh, and uh, with the name of Shakamuni Butsu on it and gave it to us as a present as a wedding present Mm. so he married you? yeah we, we were the last people that he married so where'd she come from? you you uh you know, well, that was Gretchen, you know. Yeah, no, I know Gretchen. it's Gretchen, but see, uh, Gretchen ha- had been, you'd left her on the East Coast, then you'd gone to Tassajara, then you came back out and you said you had a couple of girlfriends, and then all of a sudden you said you married Gretchen. So at what point That's did right. you all get reunited there? Well, I had a very intense uh, relationship with a girl there. Mm-hmm. After getting out of Tassajara, well, actually, while I was at Tassajara, um, this uh, very pretty girl came up to me and asked me, uh, it was, I guess, during practice period, but I was working on the stone walls, you know, and she came up and asked me, well, where where are the women's baths? And I said, oh, just down the, down, the, down the pathway there. And she said, well, would you show me? I said, okay. And I walked her down there, and we walked into the entrance to the women's bath and there's nobody there. Then she took off all her clothes and got into the hot water. And I was like, Bong. you know, I was like totally zapped by the sight of this beautiful young woman in the hot water um, paddling around. Mm-hmm. And then later, uh, after I, but she wouldn't go any further than that. But then later, after I got out of Tassajara, um, I we were still living in Page Street, and um, who's for a we? While there. Who's and, we? 
everybody. Yeah. You know, right across from Sokoji. Not on Page Street, but on what's the name of that on street? Bush street. That Sokoji on Bush on. Street. Bush Street, I mean. Yeah, we're still living on Bush Street. Yeah. And uh, in those two houses. And uh, so she came and started living with me there. And and then uh, then I was forced to make a decision. So it was, we became very intensely involved for a while. Then I had to face the decision of was I going to marry her or marry my old love, Gretchen, who was still at this ashram in Vermont for seven uh-huh. years. Uh-huh. And wow. I'd been back there once or twice to see her. Wow. Wow. And and just something, while I was sitting in Zaza and something kept tugging at my mind that I was supposed to marry Gretchen. Hmm. So one day I called her up and said, would you come out here and marry me? And And it turned out just at that time, she was thinking of it was about time for her to get married, and um, she she had a, a potential she had a suitor who was living at that ashram. But um, the woman who was the teacher at the ashram told her she knew me very well. Nina was her name, and she said, "No, you should go out and marry Jeff." So she came out and married me mm. in nineteen seventy one. What month? Oh, let's see. When did what month was it? I think it was in uh, June. I think it was. Hmm. Yeah, boy, that would be. Did you get married in the city? In the city center, then, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Huh. And then we went. Soon after that, we went to Japan on the. Yeah. Exchange program. Yeah. Well, you've sort of come full circle there. Um, Yeah. Wow. Quite a life. That's really good. And you're teaching now in in, the University of Minnesota, where so many people came to Zen Center from Minneapolis. My God. You're in Minneapolis, right? Right. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Katagiri was st- still here when he, when we first came here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh. Yeah. And did you did so you we, have some involvement with him there? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We practiced there, and we were good good friends, and um, stuck with him to the end there. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, sad. But I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. But you haven't what? Oh, I haven't been much involved since then with Minnesota Zen Center. Mm -hmm. I realized for me that, you know, sitting Zen, no matter what, it would raise up a lot of anger mm. and a lot of deep stuff that I didn't know how to resolve. And so mm-hmm. after Gretchen divorced me, then in a couple of years, I, I got together with a woman in the sociology department and we got married and we got together in 92 and got married in 96. And so i have been with her for almost, uh, 30 years now and my life is totally and my mind is totally you know transformed Mm. and it's like really being planted in one place in one relationship Mm. and stabilizing tremendously Mm -hmm. and uh, and doing a lot of therapy on uh, sexual issues and you know, like, I remember one time we talked and you said that you had great parents and you didn't have any traumas from your childhood. And I was telling you how I had all these traumas from my 
childhood from a lot of bad experiences. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, you had one of the most seriously traumatic childhoods, uh, you and Ed Brown. Oh, really? I didn't know Ed did. Shit, yeah, man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, his mother died when he was just a little tiny kid, like four or something, and his father put him and his brother in an orphanage, and then they were separated, and then, you know, after some time, his father got married and took them out, and Ed is still dealing with that. What happened to you? Oh, boy, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Ed talks about it quite a bit, you know. I mean, it's no secret. Uh, what, 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 oh, what, wow. What happened to you? Oh, well, um... Oh, it's very complicated stuff, but I mean, my parents didn't get along sexually, and so when I was about four, four or five or something, my mother started having an affair, and then my parents started fighting and hitting each other, and I remember trying to separate them, and there was blood and mm. and then she kicked him out of the house and he couldn't come back in and they they threw him in a mental institution for a while and then then he he got out and he would I would see him once in a while with my brother and sister on the weekends a, a little bit mm. and uh, then my mother uh, and they were just you know yelling and hating each other all the time. And then uh, my mother put me in this home for gifted boys and put my younger sister and brother into an orphanage so that she could be free to date somebody else and develop another relationship. And then my father came to this home and he asked if we wanted to run away together. And he was going to get my brother and sister, and we'd all run away together. And I said, that sounded, like, exciting, you know. And I went with him, and I was about seven or eight at the time. And then um, and he couldn't find my brother and sister, so the two of us just left. And we just started traveling around the country, escaping from the police and moving every six months. Mm. And he was mentally ill. Uh, paranoid hmm. and he had his all his teeth pulled out because he thought the dentist had poisoned them and oh and yet he was yeah he was you know in a lot of but yet he was a tremendous seeker and he kept going to different religions and eventually we ended up with the quakers when i was about 12 years old hmm. and we and we it was really wonderful you know we were sitting meditating with the quakers and going on peace marches and hmm. and then at the Quaker Quaker seminary called Pendle Hill when I was twelve, that would be nineteen fifty six, I met a Zen priest named Sohaku Ogata from uh Myoshinji, I think it was. And, and he had written a book called Zen for the West. Uh huh. And the uh, State Department had him touring around the U.S. and funded him. And he showed up at this Pendle Hill Quaker place just when I was there. And I looked at him and I said, my God, this guy has this like peace of mind. His mind is so quiet. I've never seen anything like it. Mm. It's like an aura around him. Mm. Wow, what is this? You know, I'm so interested in this. What and year so was that? A little bit what and, year was that? In '56. And how old were you? Was that were you twelve? Twelve, yeah. Wow. Go on. That's really interesting. Yeah, and, and it just so struck me, you know, that I after that I just started reading tremendously about Zen and, and, uh, you know, just was fascinated with the whole thing. 
Wow. Um, and listen, if your father took you away from that place, that would bring the FBI in, wouldn't it? Well, the police were trying to find him. You know, they were on his trail for a while. And like, I remember one time he came rushing into my elementary school and said, they're here, we've got to leave. But he, we jumped in the car and took off and went to another city, you know. So they never tracked him down. But, but, but the police police don't leave their cities. I mean, if people are tracking him, it's got to be at least state. Did he stay in the same state? Oh, no, we left. Yeah, it's the FBI. So we, it's got to be the FBI. We left Chicago, and we went to Wisconsin, and then Michigan, and then Ohio, and then down to Florida. Where was Ogata? Where was Ogata? Well, by that time, that was in Pennsylvania. Uh huh. I've heard of that book, yeah. and I've heard of him. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was an early book. Uh, Zim for the yeah. West. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to look that up. Uh, that was in Pennsylvania. So, but your your father w was never caught. They, they at some point they no. Yeah, no, they never they never caught him. Yeah, and uh, and I, I imagine you were glad they never caught him. Yeah, well, I didn't like my mother very much. She was very harsh. Had, like you know, beaten me for letting my father into the house and um, mm -hmm. different things, and so I was you know wanted to get away and uh, wow. I thought it was a good adventure at the time. Although we were just, you know, moving all the time, and he was afraid of the evil forces chasing him. Wow! But of course, they were actually chasing him as well. Yeah. Uh, what would he do? When? Because I wonder about. Did you ever see a running on empty about a family going from town to town? Saying, but that, that's because of a, a left wing uh, work where you know. They'd been involved with like the weatherman or something or bombing or something. So running from the FBI from town oh. to town. That's pretty. Oh good. yeah. Well, he would. Yeah, he would. He he had been trained in the printing trades mm -hmm. by his father, who was in the printing trades, and he'd be been a photo engraver, which was a well-paid specialty within the printing trades. And so he was able to pick up work you know, during the 60s like that, or 50s, mm -hmm. wherever we went, and work for a while, and then he'd somehow engineer to get himself fired, and then he'd live on unemployment compensation for as long as he could in that area, and then we'd move on also to another area and do the same thing. If he's living he on unemployment like compensation, he'd be easy to track down by the FBI, so that must have... Uh... Well, I don't know how it all worked, but things were more divided up at that time. You know, there weren't such uh -huh. databases and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. So um, uh, I imagine your father is no longer with us. That's right. He, he died more than uh, 10 years ago. Oh, so... Actually, rather recently. Uh, uh, yeah, he lived uh, to be about 91. Yeah. So how was your relationship with him, you know, after you... What, how old were you when you left home? Well, I mean, they put me in that school when I was about... Maybe I was eight, and then he came and got kidnapped me, or so-called took me away. I guess I was around eight. Yeah. No, but when when you... You stayed, how long did you live with your father? Oh, until I was 17. And what, did 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 he find, like, you were in Pennsylvania when you were 12. Did, did he manage to stay there? Oh, that was just being at that Quaker seminary, you know. Oh, I for see. For a while, Kendall Hill. I see. Then we we went finally... Finally, the last three years of my high school, we stayed in one place for three years mm. in uh, a little 
town north of Baltimore. Mm. And, uh, and so I went to high school for three years. And then when I was 17, I, uh, you know, left him and went to college for a semester and then dropped out and went into the slums in Philly and worked at a settlement house there to help, try to help the African-American people there. Mm. Wow. Well, hey, well, that really, um, that really, uh, you really uh, uh, drew some new circles in the story of your life since the last time I, I said that was an interesting life story. Um, uh, so, uh, listen, um, do you have any uh, concluding uh, thoughts? Concluding thoughts. Well, if this is going down for posterity in some way, um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess my thoughts about Zazen and how it, for me, you know, for people who have a lot of, like, psychic turmoil in their past, that's kind of buried in their unconscious. Mm -hmm. Like Zazen kind of, it kind of opens Pandora's box, you know, and stuff can come out, but it doesn't give you a good handle on, on thinking it through and, and really understanding exactly what it is and where it's coming from and resolving it. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. And so then in the last couple of years here, I've been working with this psychoanalyst and we were able to get into those things and, you know, through talking about the deep feelings and where they're coming from about fears and insecurities and anger and tracing it way back, like to where my mother had an affair and cast out my father. And then he was told me that my father felt castrated mm. essentially mm. by that and felt, you know, a lot of emotional tension and turmoil, mm. which I picked up and it caused a lot of deep anger in me, you know, mm. and then also being dragged around, all over the country, never having any friends, going from place to place, you know, a lot of different sources of deep buried anger, which I never knew about. Mm. But would in Zazen, feelings of anger would come up, but I couldn't put my finger on where they were coming from, mm. mentally speaking, mm. and in the past. And so, you know, discovering that the mind has all these layers of of memories and emotional formations that are in there, but that drive us and affect us, you know, and cause depression or mm. um, self hatred or other kinds of negativities mm -hmm. you know, that, that, but the Zazen doesn't really heal them very well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that for me, at least in my particular path, you know, I did years of psychotherapy, which was, sort of a band-aid thing and then finally getting into psychoanalysis which is much deeper uh really began to get at some of these things and like learning about my father's castration complex you know and you know it's the analyst's interpretation but I, it really struck home mm -hmm. you know and enabled me to put together some of the deep sources of anger and anger against my mother for you know, beating me up and, and, uh, being so furious at me, uh, and then leaving, you know, and no chance to resolve that anger. Mm. And so that kind of thing, you know, I mean, people, other people have experiences. Some, some people have experiences like that where, you know, you have to then, it affects you the rest of your life, but to get into it, and really 
tease it apart and understand where it's coming from yeah is, is helpful in resolving it yeah well you you certainly have uh to a great extent i mean just i can tell you from how different it is to talk to you now about this and have you very clearly explain it all and this and that when you first told me about this you just started crying and uh um really and and then in later years when i asked you about it you know maybe 20 i don't know how long ago 20 25 years ago uh, you, you were very uncomfortable uh you couldn't really get into it um because i was interested from what you told me back in the 60s but right now when you talk about it it's you're just totally clear and calm and uh and uh are just looking at it it doesn't seem to have power over you like it did yeah i think that's true yeah yeah the you know i mean here i am in my mid 70s and on um, Finally, the last couple of years, going into this analysis, this depth analysis, and really confronting it and learning learning what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I wanted to ask you um, uh, how your relationship did, with your uh, father was after you left. Oh, well, he... He, he, he uh, then left our little apartment we had been living in so then i had no no home you know no place to go and i was just entirely on my own so mm -hmm. i was just making it one way or another you know working or being in this settlement house for a while and then mm -hmm. um and then we met up again a year later in yellow springs ohio mm -hmm. and uh had some good adventures together, but um, he became, uh, he was emotionally dependent on me in a way. Mm. And and that was difficult for me because I was trying to establish myself as an independent person. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was in touch with him off and on then after that. Like when I was at Tassajara later, he came to visit me at Tassajara, and we hung out together for a while. And then when I was living at the Berkeley Zen Center, he was living in Berkeley. Hmm. We, yeah, we took an acid trip together. Far out. And, uh, <laughs> How was that? Yeah. Well, actually, the first time we did that was in 64 when I was at Goddard, and he came up to visit. Wow. And Gretchen and I, Gretchen and I took him on an acid trip, and we read to him from Leary and Alpert's version of the Book of the Dead, you know? Oh, yeah, pages. I used that. I used that for my uh, acid trips. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and he had a wonderful trip and a wonderful vision, and it, it really... Uh, Gave him some kind of visions uh -huh. to live with, to uh, live by. Yeah, that that book was called the Psychedelic Experience. Oh yeah, okay. Wonderful book. I loved it, and I thought it yeah, it, it yeah. gave it gave very responsible, good advice about how to take LSD, especially for the first time in the early trips, and. Uh, uh, you know, emphasizing the set, the setting, having a guide. Um, uh, it was really good. Yeah. And I followed that. I always yeah. followed that. I always followed that. I got oh, very good. extreme. I turned yeah. on a lot of people that answered. I would, they, they had to agree to sort of uh, fast and meditate beforehand. We'd take it with uh, an agreement not to talk. And if they start talking, we had an agreement. I would remind them. Uh, that we weren't that always worked, and we would take it in a natural setting, preferably with no nothing humanly built in view. 
Uh, and oh, wow. I just never had any trouble, including with people who have mental problems. And just one trip, Wonderful. somebody had a sort of uncomfortable and stuff, but it wasn't terrible or anything. Uh, oh. Yeah. And what about your mother? Did you ever see her again? Yeah, well, she remarried, and then in uh, 1974, when I was, well, let's see, no, so like, from the time I was eight until the time I was 20, I didn't see her or my brother and sister. We were just traveling. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to uh, Goddard College after the first semester, I, I, I hitchhiked out to Chicago to look for her in, uh, in around 64 and then uh, found her and she uh, she agreed to meet with me at a restaurant. She wouldn't let me come to her home. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I stayed for a couple of days at my grandmother's house, who was there. So I got to meet them, but they were very standoffish and very critical of me for having left, even though you know I was just a kid. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but then about 10 years later, after I'd just gotten accepted into Harvard, and I was driving cross-country with Gretchen, we stopped by, and then it was all like smiles and welcome, and we could stay at the house, and I had, you know, become somebody, and um, uh -huh. so I felt kind of cynical about that, but I tried to make a good relationship with her, Yeah, and Took her to Japan. Oh. Uh, yeah, took her around Japan. Introduced her to Tanaka Shinkai Roshi. We went to psychology, and Tanaka Shinkai Roshi said that in the next life, he would marry her. That is something. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we got to be pretty good friends again, and I would visit her occasionally. Uh -huh. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Wow, that's good. Uh, yeah. Well, you've had a lot of resolution and evolution and realization, and uh, yeah, I, that's really great hearing all that. That's good. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it's, it's nice that nice that you're interested, and I can tell you about it. Yeah, well, you're interesting. <laughs> you always have been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you are too. <laughs> uh, well, I think we ought to wrap it up then. Uh, okay, Jeff. Very good. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to. Oh, well, thank you for your interest in recording all these Zen influenced lives and stories yeah and uh preserving them and weaving them together and now there's a lot more i could tell you about about all this but uh we'll do it maybe some other time yeah well think about it take notes uh and and uh you know i'm working on a book called tasara stories and i'm reading pieces from it once a week on podcasts so anything oh you've you've got there uh, and I, I already have you in it some, but uh, uh, anything you've got there, uh, I'd appreciate. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the the deeper veins of enlightenment and beginning to open up the mind, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, edges there that are interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, let's be in touch. And write me anytime. Okay? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks. We'll be well, and it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, great to talk to you. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Thanks, David. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.
So thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate it. Good to talk with you. Been a while. If you want to know more about Jeff, you can Google him. Jeffrey Broadbent, University of uh, Minnesota, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, just go to cuke.com. And uh, I've already got a page for him with a lot of stuff on it. But, um, you know, I'll see if I can put some time into it and beef it up, see if I can find anything else. To In fact, I just added something today to it that I happened to run into. So uh, just go to the homepage of cuke.com and write broadbent in the site search box, and that'll take you there. And he mentioned uh, writing a book uh, about his uh, studies, sociological studies in Japan. So look, I just looked under uh, Jeffrey Broadbent in uh, on Amazon.com, and there are two books: Environmental Politics in Japan: Networks of Power and Protest, and East Asian Social Movements: Nonprofit and Civil Society Studies. The latter one you can get Kindle. Hey, they are very, very expensive. They're these academic books. I don't know why they do that. Maybe that's the way they used to do it. They don't have to anymore. You can make it print on demand. Oh, and here I discovered another one. I did see it on um, Amazon. But when uh, I looked him up at the University of Minnesota, where he's a sociology professor, they had three books listed. The third one being... Comparing Policy Networks, Labor Politics in the U.S., Germany, and Japan. Boy, you sure never know what a wild man he is by looking at the titles of his books. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm DC Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Ooh.